Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When you come to a courtroom, witnesses or expert witnesses play an essential role in the final decision. Now, the courtroom of public opinion is fickle, and it, it changes constantly. However, what really matters to those who are involved in any particular court case when it comes to evidence or testimony is this. What is considered legitimate evidence and whose testimony is reliable? In our lesson from 1 John's epistle, the Apostle John speaks to the church in Ephesus and tackles this issue of testimony. And he provides three reliable witnesses, not for the general public, but three personal witnesses for you and for me. Now, John doesn't have to argue that Jesus existed. To John's listeners, to whom he originally wrote, it would be kind of like questioning if we questioned whether like Elvis Presley or Martin Luther King Jr. existed. People weren't wondering that. Everyone assumed it was true. Nor were people questioning really whether or not God existed, especially at that time. Practically everyone believed in divine. They believed in God or more likely in God's. The question was, can we believe what the apostles are claiming about Jesus of Nazareth? Should we really believe and live as if he is our leader and savior? Should we risk changing our lives because we believe Jesus will save and resurrect us? Trust and leadership is still a very important question for us as human beings. We're constantly deciding, do I trust this person or do I not trust them? And we think about other human beings. Are they trustworthy? Is, this, is he trustworthy or is he misleading? Can I believe what she says or should I double check? Now, trusting someone can bring you great uh, relief. Trusting is a uh, comfort and provides some certainty in life, peace of mind. It's a relief to be able to just let go of something because you think, I can trust this person. On the other hand, if you trust someone and they turn out to be untrustworthy, you feel betrayed. You feel life feels a little bit unbalanced. You might lose money or positions or even in extreme cases, your health or your life. In John chapter 5, we, the apostle describes these three witnesses. Again, the key point being God, John is telling us about three witnesses for you and me. These are the three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree. And this is the testimony, a few verses later, that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. And whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, remember, if we're thinking, it's, it's always easy, at least for me, to forget as we read these epistle letters who's writing. But this is the Apostle John. Remember, he was the only one of the 12, at least that we know of, it certainly seems like, who was actually present at Jesus' crucifixion. And looking back at the gospel that John wrote, particularly at chapter 19, verses 33 through 36, I think is really key to understanding what in the world John is talking about. But when the soldiers came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once there came out water, blood and water. He who saw it, John's talking about himself, has borne witness his testimony is true. I'm, I'm telling the truth. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. 
In other words, if you remember John, we're talking about here, who has an eye for signs and symbols, is talking about the water and blood which flowed from Jesus' side as the Roman soldiers pierced him. Uh, This flow of water and blood certainly was something that must have stuck with John because, again, he saw it. He was close to the foot of the cross probably when this happened because we see him with Mary earlier there. And this water and blood verified clinically that Jesus was dead. This water and blood were a reliable witness, medically accepted, that Jesus, John's Lord, was dead. But the masterful stroke John recognizes is that the water, blood, and spirit give testimony to us still. They not only testify, as they originally did, to Jesus' death, but also blood and water, they testify to eternal life for us in Jesus. And here's the, the quick and dirty version, which I'll unpack. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit speaking to us in God's Word. The water is our baptism, and the blood of the Passover lamb testifies to you and me that Jesus is alive and working. Again, the way it works is these things originally testified to Jesus' death, but, I mean, just read through 1 John 5 again. But now, John says, they testify to life. And who do they testify? To you, he says. These are God's testimony to you and me. Um, Now, they're not proof for the world, uh, but they are proof to believers, to you and me. And we'll get to why in a minute. However, to be clear, um, God is not looking to convince the whole world of his existence. And he doesn't really bother trying to prove it. God is interested in trust, in your faith. If it was convincing God was after, the cross would be unnecessary. God doesn't want, God's main goal is not just that everybody knows he exists. His main goal is that you have faith. Now, this reminds me of a really impactful quote, at least to me, from one of my favorite book series, The the Chronicles of Narnia. And there's a particular book called The Horse and His Boy. And in that book, one of the main characters has an encounter with the king of beasts, the the savior, if you will, of Narnia, the lion, Aslan. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, with Aslan. Aslan reveals that both many of the rescues as well as many of this boy's problems in this story have actually been orchestrated by Aslan himself. And then Shasta asks, what will happen to the other characters whom he has been separated from? And and Aslan replies, child, I am telling you your story, not hers. No one has told any story but their own. Well, I think God often does operate like that, especially when it comes to faith. Jesus gives us proof why we can believe, not necessarily proof for everyone else. Now, sometimes we, you know, I, I like apologetics, and I think that the, the Bible is a reliable witness, and we could, the more you look at it, the more you'll be forced to say, hey, this is, this is something that should be considered. Um, but sometimes, sometimes proofs can be distract us from what's even more important, because we don't need God to prove anything to us that the cross has not already proved. What we need is to trust God in this moment. What you need is to trust God now, in in your crisis, in your doubt. And that's how the testimony works for Christians as well. Um, Baptism is not really a sign for the outside world, uh, right? The world just sees water. It doesn't see anything significant. But for you and me, it's a promise. It's a testimony to to believers. Baptism is a wonderful comfort and testimony that your sins have been washed away and that you are a child of the king. Baptism is a witness to our adoption into God's family and that the Holy Spirit was sent to you and to me. 
the blood of Christ is also a testimony to us. Now, Jesus may not appear to us and speak to us, and yet Jesus does come near to us. Now, it just looks like bread and wine to the outside world, but this also is a sign to you and to me. Communion is a testimony that we have been crucified with Christ, that Jesus' death is not just his, but that his blood covers us. We have been redeemed from death, just like the Hebrew slaves on the eve of the Passover. And because of that, we have confidence in Christ because the blood of Christ speaks in any, a better word than any argument for or against the existence of God. And in it, my Savior speaks directly to me. He interacts with me in his body and blood. The blood of Christ speaks a more compelling word than the accusations of the accuser. The blood of Christ speaks with more authority than your sins or your failures. No matter what the world or you or I say or how we doubt, the precious blood of Christ speaks more loudly, more clearly, and more truly. And that's why we take this meal and receive it with thanksgiving as we are forgiven and included in Christ. Now, we may not really notice the Holy Spirit, the third sign either, but he clearly is working in your and my lives. After all, no one, the Bible says, can say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that convicts us of our sin. So repentance is one of the signs of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. We cannot believe by our own reason or strength. So the fact that we are comforted by the forgiveness of our sins or trust in Jesus is proof that the Holy Spirit dwells in you and me. All this is why John encourages us that we can have confidence. We have confidence uh, not only to believe, but as he says in our epistle lesson, to come before our Heavenly Father with requests. We have three witnesses, water, blood, and spirit. The water of baptism, the blood of the Lamb, and the Holy Spirit sent to us. We not only see or learn about these things. No, you experience these things. We are given them. They're not just a sign, but they are a gift to you and me. We've been baptized. We have the Lord's Supper, and we have the Holy Spirit. We are, we are witnesses because we've been baptized into the waters of baptism, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and have, we, have, we have faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Christians can live confidently. It doesn't matter what anyone else says or what the world is saying or what's happening around us. We can live confidently because if we are under attack, then we are under the divine protection of the Heavenly Father. If we need help or doubt, we can cry out to him and he will answer, hear us and answer us. We therefore live confidently because if Christ, because Christ is risen, and rules at the right hand of the Father. We live confidently because nothing can compare with Christ, and he has personally given you and me testimony that he is for us, that we are his in water, in blood, and in the spirit of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen.